Good morning. I hope you're having a, a great day in the Lord. If you would take your Bibles and open them up to Numbers chapter 17. We're continuing on in this saga that started all the way back in uh, chapter 15 and 16. Uh, really, we have the rebellion of Korah. We have God judging uh, the families, the 250 people that were following uh, Korah to the point where the earth opens up. They fall down into the grave and the earth then closes back up. A pretty visible sign from God that whatever was going on with these people wasn't what he wanted. I mean, that's just to put it mildly. Affirming the leadership, yes, of Moses, but really the argument with Korah and the sons of Kohath were really about the priesthood, really focused on Aaron. And so when this miraculous execution happened, it was a clear sign from God that God, whatever Korah and these 250 followers were about was not what God wanted them to be about. And you might think that that would be a clear enough sign for Israel to then focus in and follow and get behind Aaron. However, that did not happen. What do we find happening at the end of chapter 16 and verse 41? On the very next day, the children of Israel are grumbling and complaining again about leadership, about Moses and Aaron, to the place where um, they're accusing Moses and Aaron of the 250 people being killed. Well, obviously they can see that the earth opened up and swallowed them up. But remember what has happened before. Moses had prayed when the people had sinned and God would relent. And so now they're not even really examining their own sin. They're just saying, hey, we're supposed to sin and Moses, you're supposed to step in and fix it. Well, we're going to see as numbers keeps going on and the grumbling really doesn't stop. But what we do see is that God lets death reign for a short time to let the people see uh, the repercussions of sin and to give them a greater opportunity to understand the character of God, of which they really, for the majority, do not learn. At the end of chapter 16, nearly 15,000 people are killed by God's wrath. Um, the plague goes out. It would have been more if Aaron had not stepped in. And you would think that now when Aaron steps in and stops the death, that that would be the end of it. But God wants to make sure that he gives them a clear sign that, that they, they will not listen to, by the way, but a clear sign that the murmurers and the complainers could never stand before God and say, we didn't know. So that's what chapter 17 is about. Chapter 17 is about uh, a rod and We'll talk more about that after you've read and after we pray, and we'll we'll get into chapter 17 together. So if you haven't read it, stop the video right now and read the text. Get used to reading the text a few times, uh, going through, finding out what are the key phrases, what are the what is the author, Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, trying to tell us about the character of God. And then from the character of God, let's see, where do the humans in this fall? Are they rebelling? Are they learning? Are they, what's going on in how man 
is relating to the character of God. Because remember, ultimately the baseline is the character of God because the character of God never changes. And we'll try to apply this uh, to the new covenant where we're at now um, all along the way. So read chapter 17 and let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your inspired word. Your ways are so much higher than our ways. And Father, you are so transcendent that unless you have revealed yourself to us, we could never have gotten to know you. And so, Father, may we not take it for granted today that we are able to open up a book, to read words on the page that are gifts from you, that show not only uh, what you have done in the past, but we can also depend on that your character has not changed even in thousands of years. Father, today, may your character be the ruling effort in our life. Help us to know you better today, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when we're talking about a rod here, we're not talking about a fast car. We're, we're, we're talking about a shepherd's staff. Um, if you probably Psalm 23 is most familiar to us where it says your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So a rod uh, would be something that a shepherd would carry. Uh, the difference in a rod and a staff, they were, uh, a staff would have a crook on the end, like a hook, where the staff could be reached down and pull a lamb up uh, from danger. So the, but a rod was used to discipline. We saw all the way through Exodus uh, chapter, well, starting in chapter four of Exodus, where Moses is called by God and he's been a shepherd in the wilderness of Midian for 40 years. God training him, God humbling this prince. And then God tells him to take the same staff, the same shepherd's rod, that he's had for decades and he tells him to throw it on the ground and it becomes a snake and miraculous power is displayed by God through the staff. So the staff equals God's authority delegated on the person who is holding it. So keep that in mind as we're talking about the, the rod here, the staff. And so then when the Lord spoke to Moses, he said, speak to the sons of Israel and get from them a rod for each father's household, 12 rods. So one for every tribe of Israel, father's households is talking about each tribe. Each tribe is to bring a staff, a wooden stick um, to the tent of meetings or to the tabernacle. And they were to write or carve in the staff the name of the tribe. So if it was Manasseh, if it was Ephraim, if it was Judah, if it was Issachar, it was Gad. However, one caveat, on Levi's rod, they were to pick, not put Levi, but Aaron. Why? Well, God has already made it clear in the tribe of Levi that God has chosen Aaron. Why would you say that? Because of what happened with Korah. God has already made it clear that from the tribe of Levi, Aaron is my servant. Aaron is my priest. And so Aaron's name is on that rod. Verse four, it says, you shall then deposit them in the tent of meetings in front of the testimony. What's the testimony? Well, the Ark of the Testimony. So remember, as you come into uh, the tabernacle, there was, just, just to be reminded, the first thing you run into is the burnt offering altar. 
Then when you go past the burnt offering altar, there would be a big vat of water called uh, the laver to purify or wash when they were doing sacrifice. You go past the burnt offering altar and the laver, and then you would run into this tent. Two thirds of the tent were called the holy place. And in the holy place, when you first walk in the tent, right, there was a table of the presence, which had the showbread on it. Then on the left, you have the, uh, the light, the candelabra, uh, the menorah there uh, that is giving light into there. Then straight ahead would be the golden altar of incense, uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit interceding. Now behind that, there was a curtain. And so behind this curtain was called the Holy of Holies. The only article of furniture in the Holy of Holies is the Ark of the Testimony, sometimes called the Ark of the Covenant. So it appears that the veil is here and Aaron is laying their rods in front of that. Remember, God's presence is behind that veil. The priest, the high priest, could only go in there once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and only with the blood of the sacrificial lamb could he go in. So, it says, there. that is where he, I meet with you, verse 5. It will come about that the rod of the man whom I choose will sprout. Thus, I will lessen from upon myself the grumblings of the sons of Israel who are grumbling against you. Interesting, they're grumbling against Moses and Aaron. Uh, really, they're grumbling against God's guidance. But again here, all of the congregation is not hearing this instruction from God so that they have to trust that God is speaking with Moses and that Moses is telling them the truth. And it's, there's faith required. And so you can understand how they could start to think that Moses is just messing with them and that Moses doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, they have to believe that God is the one speaking with Moses and that God is the one guiding him. However, they're not privy to the conversations that we are reading here in the text. So Moses therefore spoke to the sons of Israel and all their leaders gave a rod apiece for each leader according to their father. So 12 rods with the rod of Aaron among their rods. So Moses deposited the rods before the Lord in the tent of the testimony. Now, the stage is set. God is going to reveal himself. Um, he, God is going to do something that only he could do. Uh, on the next day, Moses went into the tent of the testimony and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted. That was a miracle, a dead piece of wood has life coming out of it. And remember, this dead piece of wood is not hooked to any roots or to the ground, um, but it, it sprouts. That's a miracle. Um, not only does it sprout, it also put forth buds a greater degree of a miracle. Uh, now, it didn't just produce buds, but it produced blossoms. So we got buds, blossoms, and also almonds, fruit, mature fruit on the stick after one night. Uh, with a healthy almond tree, it would take all year for a mature, healthy tree to do this. And God does it in one night. It, it kind of reminds me of, if you go to John's gospel, uh, the first sign that Jesus gives, and you know, John is giving different signs that we should believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the substitute that God has sent to save 
uh, sinful mankind. And he, he goes to a wedding and they run out of wine. And they take uh, dish water, basically, and Jesus turns it into wine. Now, water into wine is something that happens in nature. Rain comes down, falls on the ground. It, uh, the, the root of the grapevine pulls it in. It goes up the vine. It nourishes the vine so that the vine can uh, sprout. And then from those sprouts come buds, and those buds blossom, and then grapes come forth. And people take the grapes and crush them and uh, grape juice comes out of them and then the grape juice is uh, aged and it becomes wine. Jesus takes that natural process and just eliminates the time. Same thing he does here. An almond tree does all of this in the natural sequence and God is just letting everybody know that he's the one in charge of the sequence. Also, a great point here, a side note, but a great point about the character of God. God is not confined by time. God is not confined by space. God is not confined by matter. All of these three things are very much confining for humanity. Time, space, and matter basically rule everything about our lives. It does not with God. And when Jesus shows up on the scene, he, he, he does this quite often, showing that time and space and matter really don't confine him. A miracle has happened. Um, what's the principle? It's describing for us what God has done, but it's not prescribing that we should all go out and get a rod and, and see if it if, if, if God chooses us, that he forms buds on this. That's not what's going on. But what does it tell us? It does tell us that when God's authority is willingly followed, when God's authority is willingly followed, there will be fruitfulness. And so if there's not fruitfulness, we should step back and, and examine where are we not under the authority and submitting to God's way. Uh, go to Acts chapter 1. I'll, well, I'll just read it for you. Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. It says this. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over, uh, over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Um, proof. God is giving proof to people of what he's doing. And in Galatians chapter 6, let's go there. Galatians chapter 6. He gives us a divine principle here. Galatians chapter 6. Look with me at verse 7. It says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this also he will reap. This is a across the board natural law that what you sow, you're going to reap. If I plant uh, a kernel of corn, guess what's going to grow? A kernel of corn. I can't put corn in the ground and, and expect wheat to grow up. So what I plant, I will harvest. So think through this. If I plant submission by faith to what God says, I'm going, it's going to bear fruit for God's kingdom for his glory. When I plant rebellion and murmuring and complaining and unbelief and lack of faith in God, it's going to pr produce division and conflict and chaos. And so we've got to get better about understanding 
if we're in a situation where there's chaos and trouble, how did I get here? Is there something that I have done where I have stepped out from the authority of God and I am on my own and I don't want to be on my own? He goes on to say this. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life, get to know God. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who are of the household of faith. Um, the idea here is if we're planting, now, now think through this. If we're under submission to God, we're born again, we've been justified. We have the Holy Spirit, we're in God's word and the Holy Spirit is filling us. What does that look like? It looks like what we've been talking about, CCR, conviction, confession, repentance. And then from this process of CCR, this humbling, uh, the Holy Spirit is producing in me fruit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. That was described right after in Galatians, or right before that in Galatians chapter 5. And so this fruit that's being produced in my life is then helping me to love my neighbor and to help my neighbor come to know Christ or grow in Christ just the same way I am being uh, sanctified. So this process is furthering in our lives all the time. What do we find with Israel? We find them just never furthering in getting to know God. Seem to be stuck in the same place of murmuring and complaining. Look what it says. Moses then brought out all the rods from the presence of the Lord to all the sons of Israel, and they looked, and each one took his rod. Had to been some contemplation going on at this point. But the Lord said to Moses, put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels, that you may put an end to their grumbling against me so that they will not die. It will not put an end to the grumbling and the rebellion. We'll find that. But what God is saying is, I'm not listening to it anymore. No more am I going to say anything more about the grumbling. I'm just going to step out in judgment. I'm going to take care of it. Now think through this. Uh, he says, take this rod and put it in the Ark of the Testimony. And, and I want you to think through this for a moment. The contents of the Ark of of the testimony or the Ark of the Covenant, whatever you want to call it. Now remember, the Ark is just a small box and in the box there are the contents of three things. First, there's the tablets, uh, the stone tablets that the law, the covenant from Sinai are written on. Next, there is a jar of manna in there, what God has provided for them uh, in the wilderness. And then there will be this rod of leadership. Now think through this. God's character is represented in every one of these things. The law representing God's holiness. It's there in front of them. Uh, the manna, God's love providing for them while they're in uh in the wilderness. And then the, the rod that budded, even in their grumbling and complaining, God gives them a mediator to give atonement for them, really redemption, drawing them out of slavery, helping them to grow into a walk of God's chosen people. Now, we know that the tablets represent their rebellion against God's law. Remember in Acts, uh, Exodus 32, the golden calf, Moses smashes the first tablets because they're breaking every one of them right from the get-go. Uh, we talk about the provision that God gave them and, and they rebel against that and they complain saying, we won't meet, we've already gone through that. And again, the rod that buds uh, the rebellion against God's given or delegated leadership. So 
All of this is not in a place where anyone can see it. Nobody is looking in this ark. So these things were put in the ark. So they're not a reminder uh, daily for the congregation. The congregation knows that those things are in there. But what covers these things symbolically is the cover with the two cherubim. And the presence of God dwells in on top of that which is called the mercy seat. So we have all these things, these gracious holiness, love, redemption of God in this box represented. And we've got all of Israel rebelling and breaking every one of them. God is giving mercy. So remember the mercy seat representing Jesus Christ and the redemption and the love that God and, and bringing us to God's standard in Christ. We cannot come to God's standard on our own. So we get to the end of verses 12. And before we get there, remember now Aaron equals priesthood. We've talked about this before, but I want to mention it again. Jesus being Messiah is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament offices. There are three Old Testament offices. There is prophet, priest, king. Now, we know that the kingly line from David comes from the tribe of Judah. And we know that Jesus uh, was from the tribe of Judah. So he's He's in the line of David. You can go look at the genealogies in Matthew and Luke and see evidence of that. Now, he's qualified as king. He's qualified as prophet. Prophets came from many tribes. Did he speak truth? Yes, he did. Was God's hand on him? Yes. So then the question comes up about the priest office. Jesus was from Judah and not from Levi. So how could he be qualified to be and to fulfill the office of priesthood? And Hebrews explains that. Uh, you can go read Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, where it explains that Jesus comes from a priestly line that was established before Aaron. And that's the, the priestly line of Melchizedek. And Melech means king. Uh, Zedek is priest, so priest king. Um, and you can, chapter 7 of Hebrews kind of lays that out. If you want to study more about that, there's some, there, there's, on this channel, there are videos through the whole book of Hebrews that would help you in this endeavor. Um, Jesus is qualified, prophet, priest, king. Verse 12, then the sons of Israel spoke to Moses saying, behold, we perish. We are dying. We are all dying. Now they're not just looking at their own mortality. In the last few days, uh, one day, uh, over 250 people are swallowed up by the earth. Then the next day, nearly 15,000 people are destroyed by the plague. And initially, they all want to come near God and, and, and they want to be in his presence. Now they're scared to death. If this keeps up, none of us will be able to live through this. We're next. Um, and I, I do think that from all of this, you start to see that without God's power, we're all dead sticks. Uh, that, that's kind of what's come. We need God. Um, we're all dead sticks without him. Uh, without God's power, Israel is just a puny little nation. But with God's power, uh, they're going to change the world. Um, Everyone who comes near, comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord must die. And we are, are we to perish completely? Um, you start to understand that they're not really understanding 
who God is. And God is trying to show them. Um, we know, uh, we'll go through a couple texts right now. Romans 8, 28 always comes through. It says, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and those that are called according to his purpose. Um, great verse to kind of renew our minds with when we're starting to understand who can come before God. If you, if you go read Psalm 15, after Uzzah has reached out and touched uh, the Ark of the Covenant and struck dead and David starts to write, who can come before you, God? And I think that in our day and age, we need a little more of this. We need a little more respect and understanding and fear for who God is. I think sometimes in the way we, we talk about Jesus and the way we talk about salvation, it's easy as A, B, C. We lose sight of who we are talking about. Almighty, transcendent Elohim. But this almighty, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent trinity of God, Elohim, has covenanted himself with people. Yahweh, here, made a covenant through his son, Jesus Christ, for you and for, for me. And so... Understanding that in and of ourselves, no one can come before the presence of God, not sinful people, but in Christ. Them looking forward to Christ and us looking back on what Christ did. We can have a relationship with God. This relationship with God, uh, if you remember back in John, let's go there. Let's go to John 15. John 15. Once you have this relationship with God, he wants you to produce fruit. Look what it says. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Look down at verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would be eternal, remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This is the command that I give to you, that you love one another. We've already talked about the only way that we can love one another is by loving God more and him enabling us in this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, we've talked about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Um, go there with me and look at verse 6. It says, now these things happened as an example for us so that we would not crave, crave evil things as they also crave. What are the evil things that they craved? Anything that God had not led them into. God didn't tell them that they needed meat. He gave them manna, but they wanted and craved meat. Um, God gave them the law. They craved everything outside of that. Uh, they craved uh, leadership of their own choosing rather than God's leadership. It says, do not be, evil just means not directed by God. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in one day. We'll get to that. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. We'll get to that. It says, here we are. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, 
Let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation is overtaking you, but what everybody goes through. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation provide the way of escape that you will be able to endure. The way is God's direction, his spirit, his leading. I don't want to get off evil going my own way, tempted off of following God's clear direction. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, it puts it this way. Do all things without what? Grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless, innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. Holding fast what? The word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 5, back. Ephesians 5, just a page, verse 20, puts it this way. Um, and it goes through that we're speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody with hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things uh, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Know your role. Know what God has called you to and be actively furthering God's kingdom and growing to get to know God through your giftedness. Rather than being these so-called Christians who all they do is sit back and criticize and murmur and complain. Uh, as I have spoken often with you, God is dealing with me about murmuring and complaining. And I am confessing those as sin and seeking that God will give me lockjaw, that I would take grumbling and complaining to be an affront to God's sovereignty. Me thinking that I could be a better ruler than him, which is not true. May God help us to deal with our grumbling and complaining. May we understand that in and of ourselves, we will die coming before God, but that in Christ, in God's way, in God's supply, we can come near, uh, we can be changed, and bless God, we definitely need it. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your plan. May we seek today to engage in it and be used by you to further it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.